Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. It's good to see everyone. If you're able to, join me as we stand. We're going to start off with an old song that I have never done here at Parkwood. It's called Hold the Fort. Brother Martin knows that one. <laughs> Comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace. Hasting day by 
All right, you can be seated tonight. We do greet you and welcome you. Thank you, Mark, for those, those songs. Excellent, excellent song choices tonight. Stirred our hearts, and we're grateful for that. Let me make a few announcements. You can be taking your Bible and turning to Hebrews chapter 11 uh, if you'd like. And then once you find the 11th chapter of Hebrews, mark that and, uh, and turn to Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. Um, let me make a few announcements. This Saturday, uh, the 13th, we've made this announcement a few times, but just one more time will be the funeral service for Mr. Charlie Kirkland. And so uh, if you're able to attend that, I know that would be an encouragement to the family. Uh, there's no visitation. We'll open the doors uh, between 1 and 1.30, something like that. And, uh, but the service will start right at 2 o'clock. And, uh, and so keep that in mind. We'll feed the family prior to that, so don't, don't show up before 1 or 1.30. We'll keep the doors locked, let the family have some privacy and, and spend some time together. But around 1, 1.30, somewhere in there, we'll open the doors, and the service will start at 2 o'clock. And, uh, and so keep that in mind. Continue to pray for Miss Nancy and their family. And uh, we trust that we can, we can honor Mr. Charlie, but more than that, honor our Lord and Savior, his Lord and Savior, uh, on Saturday, and so keep make that a matter of prayer. Um, there's a sign-up sheet out for mowing crews. If any of you men can help us uh, and be a part of a mowing crew, then then we would appreciate all the help we can get. If we can, if we can get 20 to 20 to 25 men or so, uh, then we will have four or five crews, uh, potentially even six crews, uh, which will mean that you'll only be responsible for for helping mow once. A month, once every five or six weeks, and so um, not not a whole lot. So if you can help us out with that, we would appreciate it. Um, as you can see, grass is growing; it's it's needing to be mowed every week now at this point, and so we'll start mowing crews real soon. So help us out if you can sign up tonight. You think you can help out? Then then do so. We would appreciate that very much. Um, men, on the twenty seventh of this month, if anybody is is interested, we are uh, we are going to. Uh, meet down at the University of Houston and watch the Cougars play baseball. And uh, they are playing University of Texas at Arlington, not the Longhorns, the Mavericks. Is that right, Andrew? Okay, all right, all right. And so a so, uh, little different, different animal there, Longhorn, Maverick. But uh, nonetheless, we're going to go watch the Cougars play baseball. That happens to be Andrew Martin's alma mater, not Houston, but UT Arlington. And so I think the game is at 6.30 that evening. Of course, we'll all be responsible for our own transportation tickets. I think tickets are only $4. Um, if you're interested in that, then see, see myself or see Andrew Martin, and we'll give you more information on that. We'll try to have a sign-up sheet for any that want to go on Sunday, but just put that date down a few weeks away. That's the 27th of this month. Um, and then, boy, what in our mission conference a blessing? Brother George alluded to in his prayer, and some have already said a few things uh, before the service. Uh, just excellent. I was overwhelmed with our, our faith promise offering. Uh, it exceeded my expectations, and I'm grateful, grateful to that, grateful to the Lord, and grateful to you. And as Brother Mark said, faith promise is good, but now we need some faith performance. And so, and so we, uh, we're looking forward to what, what we'll be able to do this year in, in world evangelism. Um, and uh, if you were not here on Sunday, then maybe you hadn't even heard, uh, and if, even if you were here, our, our number has grown. Since Sunday, we've had a few cards show up. We're right around $232,000, $233,000 uh, for missions. And so, uh, and that's just, just tremendous for a church our size. And if you weren't here and you didn't turn in a faith promise card, there's a, still a stack out on the bulletin table. It's just a business card. And uh, as Brother Mark said on Sunday, missions is God's business. And so this is God's business card. And it says, my faith promise for world evangelism. Take one of these, fill it out. Don't put your name, totally anonymous. Just fill it out and uh, drop it in, drop it in the uh, tithe box, and then we'll get it and uh, add, that to, add that to the total count. And so uh, keep that in mind. If you weren't here and you, you would like to contribute to faith promise, the cards still are available. We'll, we'll leave them available for another week or two and, uh, in, in case there were a few out that would like to be a part. Still have plenty of these these pamphlets from the conference. If you want to grab one, feel free. Um, and again, just everything was really good. Our missionaries were good. Their presentations were, were thorough, first class, really gave us an insight 
into their burden and their calling, and uh, it was really good. Brother Ken was was uh, spot on Wednesday and Thursday night, challenged us, and and um, and he's just just his his exposition, his illustrations are phenomenal. And then Brother Mark was was Brother Mark Friday and Sunday, just just tremendous. And I don't I don't know that I've ever heard Brother Mark. Uh, he's never missed when it comes to preaching on on missions. He's never missed preaching, as far as I'm concerned, but certainly missions. And uh, but Sunday morning, Brother Mark was just just tremendous, just powerful, and uh, and we're grateful, grateful for that. I appreciate it so much. Um, all right, I don't know that I'm, I don't know that I'm forgetting anything. Remember to pray for the Kirkland family, and that that service is Saturday, as I said. All right, Hebrews chapter number eleven, Hebrews chapter number eleven. We'll pick up where we left off two weeks ago as we are studying a man by the name of Samson. Well, Samson's one of my favorite characters in all of the Bible. He's such an interesting study. I told you two weeks ago that low living bears a high cost. Uh, it's often been said by different ones that sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay, I think we could change that and say cost you more than you're able to pay. Um, sin is oftentimes very subtle, it's very small. One writer compared sin to a spider bite. He said this, I quote, he said, talking about a spider bite, you can barely feel the bite, but soon the poison begins to spread. What was just a little prick on your skin becomes a terrible boil. Then that boil spreads and begins to infect your entire body, you find yourself with a burning fever, and soon the whole body is affected. And certainly that's the way that sin works. Samson is a, a good study in how sin begins small, but if we're not careful and, and if we don't deal with it, it can have a terrible effect. And in our last lesson two weeks ago, we began to look at Samson, who was, if you recall, the president if you will, of Israel. He was the judge of Israel. They did not have a king, and so they were called judges. They were the leaders of Israel between the time of the death of Joshua until the time of the first king, who was King Saul. Uh, this was a very dark period in Israel's history. As a matter of fact, you might call it the Dark Ages. Uh, the Bible says about that specific period of time that every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and there was no king in Israel. Now, during this time, Samson was raised up. Uh, we saw two weeks ago, just by way of reminder, that Samson had very godly parents. Uh, they were parents, uh, very, very humble parents, who prayed for a child. And, of course, in those days, uh, it was the great hope of every Israelite woman that she might be uh, the chosen one, the one the, to be the mother of the Messiah, the, the, the mother that would bring the Savior of the world into this world to deliver Israel from her enemies. The problem is Samson's uh, mother was not able to bear children. It was impossible for her to have a child, and yet God sent the angel of the Lord who said to her that you're going to have a, a child. He's, he's going to be very special. He's going to be very great, very powerful. He's going to govern the nation. And, of course, two weeks ago we made reference that in that sense it, it seems that, that Samson is... Uh, an illustration, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he was born of a virgin. There's no indication of that whatsoever. I'm not saying that, but, but that he was miraculously conceived. Um, and of course, Christ would become the Redeemer of Israel. She was also told that her child, that Samson, would be a Nazarite. We talked about that two weeks ago. He was one, Nazarite was one who was set apart, sanctified uh, for the service of God. And as a Nazarite, he was not to drink uh, any fermented drink, any fermented beverage. He was not to cut his hair. The Bible says a razor is not to touch his head. He was to be completely, uh, wholly dedicated to the service of God. A Nazarite was not, not supposed to touch any dead thing because it would symbolize that he would be ceremonially unclean and in that way unfit to serve God. And so God had a, I say all that to say that God had a very special plan for the life of Samson. It's evident how he was born, the miracle there, uh, the, 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 the calling upon his life. God had plans for Samson to be a great leader, a great man. 
We saw Samson's supernatural strength. Of course, it came from God. Every time that Samson would perform a, a, a great feat, uh, for example, when he took the jawbone of that donkey and killed a thousand of the enemy, the Bible would say every time that it was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon him. It's an illustration how that you and I in and of ourselves cannot do what God would have for us to do, that we must do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. He had supernatural strength, but he had a strange struggle. And that was our second point two weeks ago. He's a study in contradictions. Samson was mighty before men, very weak before women. He had a tremendous desire to serve God, I think, pretty sure of that. You find him in Hebrews chapter number 11. But he had a tremendous struggle with the flesh. And my, how relatable that can be to you and I. We're, we're going to see in this lesson, what I'm calling part two, Samson part two, um, how, how Samson gives in to that inner weakness. And when he does, he starts a downward trend that's going to end up in the downfall of this mighty man. I want you to see Samson's sorrowful sin tonight. One point this evening, his sorrowful sin and how this sin in his life begins very small. In fact, if you really get down to the root of it, his sin begins when he disobeys mama and daddy. He didn't listen to the counsel of his parents. And it's going to end with him being totally humiliated. He's going to have to give up his leadership. He's going to go from the White House to the jail house. He's going to go from the greatest position in the land to being a slave of the enemy. But I find it interesting and very, very encouraging that God remembers not his failure. When you get to Hebrews chapter number 11, God remembers his faith. And you remember what the Bible said. If you're there, notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. The writer of Hebrews says, And what shall I more say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the enemies, uh, the armies, excuse me, of the aliens. Samson is an example of no matter how successful you are, no matter how strong you may think you are in some areas of your life, if you're not careful, the devil is always trying to get you to trip up in your area of weakness, and certainly Samson shows us that tonight. Notice one point tonight, again, part two of this, uh, of this three mini-series in, in this series on Samson. Notice his sorrowful sin. I told you a second ago that it begins when he disobeys his parents. Notice in verse number 1 of Judges chapter 14. Turn to Judges chapter 14 and notice uh, verse number 1. The Bible says, and Samson went down, you ought to underline that phrase, went down to Timnath and saw a woman of Timnath of the daughter's of the Philistines. We'll stop our reading there for a moment. You're familiar with the Philistines. They were ungodly people. They, they worshiped idols. They were wicked. They were barbaric. They were cruel. The Bible indicates that they were a part of that Canaanite nation that sacrificed children uh, to their God. They were demonically inspired, just very, very wicked people. This time Israel was under the domination of the Philistines, but, but he went down, Samson, and he saw a young beautiful Philistine woman. And as we're going to learn, Samson's downfall always seems to be connected with his passion. Notice his passion. He has a passion for this woman. Notice he saw her, he desires her. Verse 2 says, and he came up and he told his father and his mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. In other words, I see her, I want her, bring her to me. Bring her to me. She's the one I want. And so he's beginning now to allow his passion to, to rule his life. And notice it began when he went down to the land of the Philistines. He went down to Timnath. That's a Philistine city. 
It all begins when Samson places himself in a place, in a city where he does not belong. And by the way, that's always the way typically that sin will begin very, very small. His passion. Notice his parents. Verse 3, Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all the people? Thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised Philistines? In other words, Samson, why can't you find someone, an Israelite woman? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Now, a part of this is not necessarily bad. I'll say more about that in a second. But a big part of it is. Notice in verse 4. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. There you go. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Now what part is, is not necessarily bad? What part is of the Lord? Was it of the Lord that he take a Philistine woman to be his wife? Well, that can't be true. That, that part can't be of the Lord because God has, had already forbidden his people to marry those of the land of Canaan. God had, had commanded his people that they were to only marry within the covenant people of Israel. You can find that in Deuteronomy specifically and other places where God has made it very clear that under the law of Moses that that is, that is not permitted. God doesn't contradict himself. God's not going to say something in his word and then tell you something uh, and make an exception for you. It's not going to happen. And so God doesn't contradict himself. The, the part that was of the Lord was not necessarily bad was the fact that he, was, that he wanted to confront the Philistines, but he's going about it the wrong way. This is not the way. His father and his mother didn't realize then the full plan that God had for Samson and uh, that God was going to use Samson as a great deliverer. It's really similar to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. I made the comparison two weeks ago where there's an easy comparison here as well, just as the parents of Jesus didn't really fully realize how Jesus was going to be used. Uh, they had an idea, but I don't think they got the full picture. Remember when Jesus was 12 years old, they journeyed to Jerusalem, uh, and then they, 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 they head back home and they find that Jesus was not with them. They look for Jesus, they can't find him, and they had to go back to Jerusalem, and they find him talking to the doctors of the law in the temple. And Jesus looked at his parents, and I'm paraphrasing, and he says, look, you, you don't realize, but I have to be about my father's business. There's a part that's, that's not of God, that, that Samson's not listening to his parents, that he's not obeying the covenant of God. Uh, and of course, we know the Ten Commandments says, God says, honor thy father and thy mother, that it may be well with thee, and that your days may be long upon the earth. God has given Samson a father and a mother that, that were godly people. Godly people. Samson is about that age where we've all been, and, uh, and, and you that have children that are teenage and older, you know this very well. He's at that age where Samson knows more than mama and daddy. Twice as much as mom and daddy, if not more. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there personally as that child, and you've been there on the side of, of the parent. And, uh, and then if you're like me, your kids aren't quite there yet. They're, they're coming. It's coming. Uh, parents, you're just behind the times. You're behind the times. You, you don't understand. You're out of touch with society, with culture. Samson is in a place where he thinks he knows more than mama and daddy. And he's insisting, no, no, daddy, I hear you, but this is the woman I want to marry. I know she's a Philistine. I get it. She, she's not a believer. She's an idol worshiper. I know that God has said we, we aren't supposed to marry these people, that we're not supposed to be unequally yoked, but, but uh, she's the one I want. She's the one I want. And so, daddy, go get her. Well, daddy tries to reason with him, Samson. Samson, why don't you ever look for a wife among our people? Why don't you follow God's word and God's command? Why do you always want to be rebellious? Why do you always think you have a better idea and a better plan and look elsewhere than, than what God has provided? And by the way, you, you're, you know this, but that's the first commandment with promise. Honor thy father and thy mother, that it may be well with thee, and your days may be long upon the earth. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is talking about the family. He said, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is 
right. Samson died a very young man. I wonder if it's because he disobeyed God and also disobeyed the wisdom of mama and daddy. I can imagine all the neighbors talking about Samson, probably saying things like this. Well, Samson's parents, uh, they must not be very good parents. They must not be leading him in the right way because Samson, he's not, even, he's not even dating someone who's a part of the covenant people. He's out there dating an ungodly woman, a Philistine woman, a demon-worshiping woman. He's dishonoring his parents. But then notice his persistence. Verse 3, the latter part, it says, And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Again, it's not all bad. He's seeking the right thing in, in the fact that he, he wants to deliver Israel from the Philistines. But he's doing it the wrong way. He's persistent. He wants his way above everything else. And so not only does he dishonor his parents, but now he's deserted his promise. He had made a promise to God. He's a Nazarite. I'm not going to touch wine. I'm not going to touch a, a, a dead, any dead thing. I'm not going to have my hair cut. But you're going to see that he begins to, to, to leave that promise. And I told you to mark this, highlight this. Then went Samson down. The word down. Because from this very moment on, Samson's going down. He's going to go down until he finally ends up at the very bottom. Here's a man who's on top. He's the strongest, most powerful, most influential man in all of the nation. Has it all. But he's on his way down. And notice in verse 5, it says, Then, Samson, then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. Now, I told you a second ago that as an Azurite, he's not supposed to drink wine. Behold, a young lion roared against him. So he's not supposed to drink wine, and yet you find him walking among the vineyards, going to a place where he's going to have that temptation, that occasion to sin. And the outcome is he's going to be continually, little by little by little, hardened by, by sin. He's going to desert the promise that he's made to God. He's going to put himself in an atmosphere uh, of, of wine. And the third step downward is he's going to, not only is he deserting his promise, but he's distorting his purpose. His purpose is to be a mighty warrior, a leader, a ruler for God. But instead of fighting God's battles, he's going to constantly be fighting his own battles. Instead of fighting for the glory of God, he's going to be fighting for the glory of Samson. Instead of God's honor and God's future, he's all about Samson's honor and Samson's future. And so the Bible says a lion comes after him. Could it be that God placed that lion there as a warning to Samson? Samson, turn around. Samson, you're going in the wrong direction. I, I have found many times in, 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 that, that when a Christian begins to go downward, away from God, that God will place something or someone in their path to give them a warning. And sometimes God will let you have a close call, a narrow escape to to give you a warning because God loves his children and God wants to protect them. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. And notice Samson rent him, that is, he tore him apart. He just totally decimated this lion. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So notice Samson, he, I think, had this warning from God. He ignores it. And what does he do? Remember in verse 5, he went down. Notice the danger. Verse 7, and he went down. And he talked with the woman, and she pleased him well. The first thing he did, he saw the woman, then he desired the woman. Now he's gone down and he's talking to this woman. Satan is, boy, he is, he is, he's got his bait hanging there. He is luring Samson in. The hook is dangling. He's getting ready to catch him. Notice how Samson defiles himself. Remember, he's an Azurite. He's not to touch uh, any dead thing. After a time, verse 8, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. In other words, I wonder, I remember killing that lion. I, I wonder if he's still laying around somewhere. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion, and he took thereof in his hands, and he went on eating, and he came to his father and mother, and he gave them uh, the honey, and they did eat. 
But he told them not that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Well, why? Why would he keep that a secret? Well, because he's not supposed to touch a dead body. And so not only is he touching the dead body of an animal, but he's eating honey that came out of that carcass. This carcass would have made a, a good spot for these bees to build a hive. And so Samson finds the lion's dead body. He sees the honey. He, he scoops the honey out. He brings it home to Mama and Daddy. Probably said something like this, Mama and Daddy, aren't I a good boy? I remembered you while I was down there on my trip, and, and I brought you back a souvenir, one that I know you'll enjoy. He brought him that honey that was so good and so sweet and so delicious, but he didn't tell them that he had defiled himself by touching the dead body of that lion. Well, going down a little farther, Mama and Daddy go with him to a wedding, have a celebration feast in the city, of the Philistines, notice in verse 10, so his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Now Samson's going to give a riddle. We talked a little bit about it two weeks ago. Here they are, everybody's drinking, they're having a good time at the party. Verse 12, and Samson says to them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you if you can certainly declare it me within seven days of the feast and find it out. Then I'll give you 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. And so he says, I'll give you 30 garments, linen garments, 30 changes of garments. That, that, that was quite a prize. You, you had to be a very wealthy individual to fulfill this kind of reward. And notice in verse 13, but if you cannot declare it to me, then shall you give me 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. And they said unto him, put forth the riddle that we may hear it. Now, Samson's smart. He's, he's got a sharp mind. Remember, we talked about his mental strength two weeks ago. And, and so Samson said, okay, boys, here's your riddle. He said, if you Philistines think you're smarter than us Israelites, let me, let me give you a riddle, and I'll, I'll, back up, I'll back it up with 30, 30 changes of sheets, 30 brand new suits. If You can get it right. It's a heavy price. You answer this riddle, it's yours. Verse 14, and he said unto them, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness, and they could not in three days expound the riddle. So they get together, they say, what is, what is meat that came forth from an eater? What is sweet that came out of the strong? What is the answer? And they, they rack their brains and they just can't figure it out. Verse 15, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Have you called us to take that we have? Is it not so? Boy, these Philistines, they're nice guys, aren't they? Real friendly. They say to this woman, listen, if you don't find out from, from Samson, from your husband, what the answer is to this riddle so that we're not going to be humiliated, if you don't get it out of him, then you're going to pay. We're, we're going to burn your house and burn you in it. It's the end for you. And that's the kind of people the Philistines were. And so you see his weakness before women. What a thousand Philistine men could not do, the tears of one woman could. Notice in verse 16, And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Dost thou but hate me and love me not? Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and has not told it to me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it to my father nor my mother. And shall I tell it to, to thee? And so here's their first fight, I guess. Samson, <laughs> if you really love me, <laughs> you tell me this riddle. Don't you trust me, Samson? You know I married you. I am your wife. You can tell me anything. Samson says, sweetheart, I ain't even told my mama. And the Bible says she wept before him seven days. Now, fellas, you can imagine how this would drive him crazy. Here he is, he's, he's married this, this woman, and instead of being happy and celebrating this marriage, what is she doing? She is crying every day and every night. And if you really love me, Samson, Samson, if you really felt about me the way you say you feel about me, you tell me this. If you really love me, and what happens? He gives in. Notice it came to pass on the seventh day, verse 17, that he told her because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. That is, she just drove him crazy until he told her. 
Verse 18, and the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, if ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. He's calling his, there's proof positive she would drove him crazy. He's calling his wife a heifer. I don't suggest that, fellas. I don't suggest that at all. Um, you're not going to hear that in any wedding marriage counseling with me. But the significance of that is no man could have gotten the answer. But again, what a man couldn't do is one woman did, and the Bible warns. The Bible warns about the danger of wicked women and the danger of impurity. Now notice the disgrace that it brings. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson. Verse 14, or in chapter 14, verse 19, and, and boy, he is so mad. He's mad that he goes down to a place called Ashkelon, and he's going to kill 30 men. Now, here's a man who is supposed to be the godly leader of the nation. Remember that. Now he's killed 30 Philistines. He took spoil. He gave change of garments to them that, that got the riddle right. And uh, he, he didn't have it. He didn't have the linen sheets. And so he just goes down and beats up a bunch of Philistines and takes them. And he went to his father's house in verse 20. But Samson's wife, notice this, was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. Now Samson's really mad. He's not through. You get into Judges 15, you're going to find out that he is... He is not finished at all with his revenge. In order to, to get revenge on these Philistines who got the riddle, notice in verse 4, Samson went and caught 300 foxes. This is amazing. And he took firebrands and burned tail and turned tail to tail, tied them up tail to tail. And he put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go in the standing corn of the Philistines and burn up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Now, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have much money at all. But I would give a large percentage of what I do have to watch Samson catch 30 foxes, tie their tails together, set them on fire, and turn them loose in a field of corn. That had to be something to see. Notice in verse 6, Then the Philistines said, Who, Who's done this? And they answered, Samson, the son in the law of the Timnite, because he hath taken his wife and given her to his companion. So he, he's lost his wife now. He's lost his honor. He's disgraced himself before God. He's disgraced himself before uh, God's people, the Israelites. In verse number 8 of chapter 15, Samson is staying in a cave in the rock of Edom. He has so distorted his purpose in life. He is supposed to be fighting God's battle, and instead he's doing silly things like trying to get revenge on his in-laws by wiping out their cornfield. You see that he's going down. You see the downfall of this mighty leader. Notice, he's defiled his purity. His wife was given to his friend. So now he's not only lost his reputation, he's lost his wife. He's disgraced his family, but boy, he's not through. Notice in verse 1 of chapter 16. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. Gaza is a major Philistine city, one of five. Verse 2, and it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning when it's day, we're going to kill him. So he's going into this harlot. You see the really the, the repetitiveness in his lifestyle. Here he is. He's the leader of this nation. He has a very, very big weakness, and it's continually distracting him from what God wants him to do. Um, yet, here's God being patient with Samson. God gives him power to defeat the enemy once again. He's given Samson chance after chance after chance. And, uh, and aren't you glad that God is merciful? He's loving, and he's caring, and he's, and he's patient, and he's long-suffering, um, if he's not, he wouldn't be giving Samson opportunity after opportunity. He's trying to give Samson the opportunity to be the leader that Samson has the potential to be, that God wants him to be. And you get in Judges 16 too, the enemies have surrounded him. They're, they're, they're wanting to take, take him prisoner so that they can bring shame to the God of Israel and ultimately kill him. And the Bible says in verse 3, Samson lay till midnight and he arose at midnight. And so the Philistines thought that he'd sleep all night long. He had been with his, 
this prostitute. They said he'll sleep all night long in the morning. We'll move in. But Samson gets up at midnight. And the Bible says, verse 3, that he took the doors of the gate of the city, the two posts, and went away with them. And there's a phrase here, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Well, you talk about strength. You, you, you talk about power. Can, can you imagine lifting gate posts out of the ground, massive gate posts, to a great city? Again, this is one of the five major cities of the Philistines. Puts these gates, these posts, bar and all on his shoulders, carries them up a hill. The Philistines wake up the next day. They look at their gate. There's no gate. It's just a wide open space now. They, they look outside. Someone says, look on top of that hill, and they see the gate to their city. Samson has got them again. He's mocked them again, but his victory is only temporary. And notice in verse 4, and it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, another Philistine woman. And so you look at the pattern of his life. And I'm almost done. We're, again, this is part two. We're going to pick up right here next week. Here he is, the leader of the people of God, and you see him yielding to the same sin again and again and again. There, there's a pattern here. He gets into that trouble, God delivers him. He goes back, he gets into the same trouble, God delivers him again. He goes back, he gets into the same trouble, God delivers him. But we're going to see next week that sin is leading him downward, and it is going to destroy him. And that is exactly what God teaches about sin in his word. God expects a standard from his children. He expects a standard from, from leaders. And, and it doesn't really matter what popular opinion says. It really doesn't matter what modern culture says, what social media says. It doesn't matter what the polls say. God has a standard. God has a standard. There's a principle in God's Word. There's principles throughout God's Word. And when Christians ignore that, when leaders ignore that, then there's a price to pay. Samson could have lifted Israel up, but instead he brought Israel down. He's defiled his purity. Now comes one last opportunity, one last chance to be the leader, the man, the judge that God wants him to be. We'll take a look at that next week as we look at the story of Samson and Delilah. We'll stop there tonight. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer this evening. Trust and pray that you have been blessed by our study of God's word together tonight. Again, if you weren't here Sunday and you'd like to be a part of our Faith Promise program, grab one of these cards that are out there by the bulletin. Just fill it out. Promised each week, promised yearly, promised each month. Just mark one of those. There are amounts there. If, if one of those amounts doesn't work, there's a blank. You can put any amount you want in that blank. Just fill it out, drop it in the tithe box, and we'll empty that after the service. Amen. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Thank you again for your, your attendance and your attention. Remember Saturday at 2 o'clock if you're able to be here. Uh, I know that would encourage the family. No visitation. We'll open the doors between 1 and 1.30 uh, on Saturday. Let's, let's be dismissed. Brother Gary Smith, pray for us if you would.